After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Now, last chapter, we noted that Abram had rescued Lot and had given to Melchizedek the tenth of the spoils that he had gotten from going after uh, the Babylonian kings and defeating them and bringing back the spoils of war. And we noted that the king of Sodom wanted to reward Abram. Abram refused to take the reward. And uh, as we get into chapter 15, you hear God speaking to Abram and telling him in a vision. A vision is a waking dream. That's the closest simile that I can use. It's like he's awake and yet dreaming at the same time in a vision. And he said to him, don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. And it, I can't help but believe that he's, he's letting him know that I am the one who have protected you in battle and I am the one that is your reward. And you were right in not wanting the spoils of war for yourself because I happen to be the one who is your reward. You see, all the material benefits that Abram could have collected for himself were of no value if he didn't have the Lord. And God tells him that, I'm your reward. Now, this is Abram. Abram has an interesting personality because after God has given him this blessing, in verse 2, Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Now, God had earlier given a promise in chapter 12 and told Abram that in him all nations would be blessed. Now, this is in chapter 15 here. It's taken place a few years after the original promise God had made, and Abram up to this point still didn't have a, a child, an heir. So Abram's upset. And he says, I don't have an offspring. I don't have a son to carry on my name or to receive the blessings that you've told me about. As a matter of fact, my chief steward, Eleazar, well, his son is really the heir because that's the way it worked according to the law at that time. And he didn't want to leave um, his inheritance to someone who didn't come from him, from his loins. And so he's upset about it. So he's complaining to God. But God made that promise to him, and he said, No, someone who comes from your own body shall be your heir. And he takes him outside, and if you ever have an opportunity to go out into the wilderness area out there in, in, the, um, in the area of, uh, of Israel, in those areas there, and there are no lights naturally. There's nothing out there other than wilderness. And you look up to the sky, it's incredible, the brilliance of the stars and the numbers of stars that you can see because there's nothing to block your view. And God says, look up there, and you see all those stars. He said, in a way, you know, God wasn't saying that, that you're going to have, you know, all the billions and trillions of stars in the universe, but he was saying, if you could count those stars, then, then you would be able to know how I'm going to bless you. And God has blessed. Uh, the way that God has blessed Abram's descendants is that we know that Jesus Christ is the one whom God has given to the world in order that we through faith may be made heirs to the promises originally given to Abram and to his seed. The Jewish nations who believed, the Jews who believed, and those who have believed prior to Christ and have walked by faith as Abram entered into that promise. And since the time of Jesus, we Gentiles who were estranged from God, having no promises given to us, have been brought into the family of Abram through the promise made to Abram originally when he spoke about through his body shall come one. Because this is not just a specific reference to Isaac, but it's also a reference to Jesus Christ, who was going to be the one whom God used to bring the nations 
to a relationship with him. And that's why he said, if you could look now toward heaven and count the stars, if you're able to number them, he said, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. And this belief is what constituted salvation for him. It wasn't the works, though he was justified by the works. James reminds us of that. He said, Abraham did work. And through the work that he did, it was demonstrated his faith was real. But it was the faith that he had that motivated the works. And that's the way it works. That's the way works are. They are never a product they are never to produce faith because works never will. All I've discovered in my life that works will do before I was a Christian was works would create in me a belief that God owed me something. But once I was saved, I discovered that the works that I now produced were a response to the salvation God gave to me. And there's a difference, a world of difference. And the Bible says that Abram believed in the Lord and that the Lord imputed it or accounted it to him for righteousness. So then he said to him, God speaking, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And so we see Abram talking and he, and he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? In other words, I believe you and I'm not doubting your word, but give me some details here. How are you going to fulfill your promise? So God speaking, so he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, which would make an aisleway in between. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he, speaking of God, said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom, I, whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. So what's taking place here is that God is establishing a covenant with him. In the time of Abram, covenants would be established between two agreeing parties. And they would get these sacrifices here. They'd cut them open like that and create an aisle. And the two would pass through in, uh, would pass in between these uh, animals that they had sacrificed. And it was the custom of the day in order for them to ratify a contract. But in order that God might demonstrate to Abram that God was the one who was establishing the covenant and God was faithful in the establishment of the covenant and would fulfill all the promises of it. In other words, God took the responsibility from Abram to fulfill the covenant promises. And God said, I will keep them myself. God allowed Abram to go to sleep and put a deep sleep upon him. And God ratified the contract himself, by himself. God passed in between. You'll see this in a second. God passed in, in between this and ratified it himself. Now, when he had placed this, he had placed these um, animals there. He sat there and he waited for God to come and to make the agreement. And it appears that there was a delay. So he's sitting there chasing vultures away from these animals. And it's kind of, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. You know, if some people were to walk by and see Abram chasing birds around, they'd, what are you doing, Abram? Well, I'm establishing a covenant. Now, who are you establishing it with? Well, I'm establishing it with God. So, oh, sure you are, right. You, you know, it, it would appear kind of humorous if you see this little old man out there chasing birds around. And that's what he was doing, just waiting on the Lord, though. And he's doing something that appears foolish to us, and yet he knew that God was going to ratify that agreement with him. So when the sun had gone down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. And then God spoke and said, your, your descendants will be strangers. And that horror and that great darkness is a symbol of the bondage that the children of Israel would experience in Egypt. And that's what God is prophesying here when he says in verse 13, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. That's what he's referring to, is the bondage that the nation Israel had in Egypt. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. And we know that this is what happened when the Jews left Egypt. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. In other words, you'll die in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation... They shall return here. Return here means come back here to this land or Canaan 
where they are at that time. For the iniquity of the Amorite, Amorites is not yet complete. When the children of Israel went into bondage in Egypt for those 400 plus years, we're told later that it was an actual 430 year time of bondage. When they returned back to Canaan, the Amorites were still there in the land. And God was giving the Amorites, which were godless people, a space of 400 years to repent. This is just a, a demonstration of the mercy of God. God is giving the Amorites space to repent, and it's going to take them 400 years. And God's prophesying it's going to take 400 years until final judgment has to come. But he gave them a tremendous amount of time to repent. And that's why he says the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The cup is not yet full. And I haven't brought judgment yet, but I will. And when you come back, that's when judgment takes place. It came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that, behold, there was a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. Now, that smoking oven is a representation of, of the suffering, and the burning torch is representative of the glory of God. And this is in reference to the way that God works in our lives, that suffering will produce glory. And so this is when this when God went through and ratified the agreement with Abram, he was demonstrating that God's glory would be seen through the suffering. And you've already seen that mentioned earlier. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. And this is his covenant. To your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, and the Kadmonites, the Hittites, Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. In other words, they would inherit those lands that these people possessed. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar, and it appears that she may have acquired that little maidservant while she was in Egypt when uh, Abram had fled on down during the famine. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please, go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Now remember one thing. What does her name mean? It means contentious. She was a nag. That's what she was. She was a nag. And she's harping on her husband. Now it's been a few years since God had said, You're going to have a child. And here is Sarai just waiting to have a child, and she's not getting any younger. And she's wondering, when's it going to happen? It reminds me of Adam and Eve, how that Eve took of the fruit and gave it to her husband, and he did eat. Same thing, same kind of thing. You see, she is saying, I know the voice of the Lord better than you, Abram. Now, God has already appeared to Abram. Abram's already developed a relationship. The Bible says he already has believed the Lord, and the Lord's accounted it unto him as righteousness. And yet, here's his wife. And I believe very strongly that our wives, my wife, has more influence on me than anybody else alive. My wife does. Because she's my wife. Because I love her. Because I want to please her. And I believe that most wives have that kind of influence over the husbands. And wives can produce a quality in terms of their devotion to their husband and submission to their husband can help a husband to be extremely godly. Or a wife can help the husband to ignore the voice of the Lord, even when he hears the voice. And that's why submission as a godly wife to a husband who is living a life for Christ, and even to a husband sometimes who is far away, is what God wants. And I see right here a wife named Sarai, a contentious woman, a dominating woman, who is bringing a man who has already been called righteous into making a decision that is going to cost him later on. And she's, you know, she's an interesting woman. She's blaming God. Look at She says that in verse 2. See, now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. It's God's fault that I haven't had the child up to this time. You know, instead of seeing God's promises as being real, she's saying, hey, if God really was real, then I'd have been pregnant by now. Obviously, it's, God doesn't want me to be pregnant. But you know what? I think I'll help God's plan. You know, we always have plan B when plan A doesn't work. <laughs> See, the Lord has restrained me, so this is my plan. Take my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. 
Now, I'm certain that Abram loved his wife, and though it was a custom of their time for them to be able to have concubines, it was not God's will for him to have Hagar. But here is Abram, and I believe out of love he listened to his wife, because it says Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Now, Sarai at this time is about 75 years old, and we see that she hasn't learned yet to listen to the Lord. As a matter of fact, as we can continue through, you'll see God working in her life. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. So this is quite a few years, in other words, after the original promise. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. In other words, after Sarai saw that Hagar was carrying a child, it was more than she could take. And what originally she thought would be a good idea turned out to be something that plagued her and got her angry, and she developed a hatred for Hagar. Hagar's carrying my husband's baby, and I should have had that baby. And boy, she got upset. So look at the way Sarai, this kills me in verse 5. Sarai said to Abraham, my wrong be upon you. Now, can you imagine that? Now, she's the one who said, take her in the first place. And then she says, it's your fault. <laughs> you know, and that's the way we are. That's the way we are. You know, I convince you to do something wrong, and then I blame you when I get caught for it. My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes, and the Lord judged between you and me. <laughs> A marvelous wife. <laughs> so Hagar has had, has conceived. She has looked at Sarai as being less of a woman than her. Sarai has responded in kind and has taken it out on her husband. So you see that the mistress, uh, Sarai, had become despised in Hagar's eyes, and then Hagar, uh, excuse me, and then Sarai got upset at Hagar and blames her husband. Now, what's Abram say? Abram said to Sarai, indeed, your maid's in your hand. In other words, hey, it's your fault. It's not mine. Uh, your maid's in your hand. Do to her as you please. And so, because she's mad, she's going to take it out of her. So when Sarai dealt, uh, and when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. So we see Hagar fleeing. Now, the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have, you, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. So the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the, then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a child. You shall call his name Ishmael. Ishmael means God hears. Because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Now, Ishmael is the father of the Arab nation. Now, the angel of the Lord is what is called a theophany, an appearance of God in human form. Because you notice this angel of the Lord, and many times as we study the Old Testament, you'll see this term, the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord found her, and the angel of the Lord blessed her. And the blessing he gave is a blessing that only God can give. The angel of the Lord is what we call the pre-incarnate Christ. It is Jesus before he has come through actual birth in the miraculous conception. And he's dealing with this woman. And he's heard her crying out in the wilderness by herself. And he's come and he said, God has heard you. God has heard you. And God will bless you. And it's for Abram's sake that she was blessed. When it says in verse 12, he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Literally, when it says in the presence, it's literally against the face of all his brethren. And he was somebody who got into people's faces. That's what it means. He got into people's faces. You know what that term means. You know, when somebody gets angry, you say, well, he really got in my face. That's what Ishmael was like personality-wise. He was a guy who was contentious, just like Sarai was. He was a wild man. 
and he would have he was always hassling and he is the father of the Arab nations then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her and this is the name you are the God who sees for she said have I also here seen him who sees me therefore the well was called Bir Lahai Roy observe it between Kadesh and Bered so Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. And Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Keep this in mind. Abram loved Ishmael. Keep that in mind as we go through this passage. He loved him. It was his son. When Abram was 99 years old, now we see 13 years of silence. God has appeared, God has made a covenant, God has ratified the covenant, and yet 13 years of silence has passed in the life of Abram, and there's nothing to be mentioned about it other than the fact that you find him at the age of 99 years old, and the Lord appears to Abram and says, I am the Almighty God, that is the Hebrew Al Shaddai, I am Al Shaddai, the Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him. I want you to note that. When God speaks, note this. If you mark your Bible, mark it. Because when God speaks to you, you never ever treat him with disrespect. When God speaks to you, you fall on your face. When God speaks to you, you are never neutral in it. You never act as if it's just a common practice. And I see that today in modern churchianity, where people are saying, yeah, Lord, yeah, Lord. I see that. I see people doing that. And it's dangerous. Because what God wants us to do is to recognize that when he speaks, there's a reaction that takes place. You may be involved in ministry, and you may say you hear the voice of the Lord. And I believe that the Holy Spirit does speak and internally does minister to us. And there are times when you hear the voice of the Lord and you recognize it. God's speaking to me. But when God will audibly make his presence known to you, if he ever does, I guarantee you, you will not treat him with disrespect. You'll do what Abram did. It's the natural reaction. You see Daniel falling down in the face of angels. You see John falling down in the face of angels. Most certainly, if God himself were to speak, you'll fall in his face, on your face in front of him also. So Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram. Abram, remember, means high father. Your name shall no longer be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Abraham means a father of multitudes, father of many nations. Now imagine that. Abraham doesn't have any children, really, other than Ishmael. And God's telling him, change your name from Abram to Abraham. It took a step of faith to do that. 99 years old, you know. What's your name, Abraham? How many kids do you have? Well, I've got one, you know. <laughs> well, what are you calling yourself Abraham for? Well, God told me to call myself Abraham. Why? Because I'm a father of many nations. And you can hear the snickering behind his back when little old Abraham would walk by. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. This is why the Jews love Israel. This is why the Jews won't let go of even a, a, a few feet of it. This is why you have people going out into wilderness out in Israel and camping out there. When we were there in Israel, Last year, there were some people who went out into the wilderness area. The wilderness area receives less than two inches of rain in a year. It's incredibly dry. It's just wilderness, just as you hear the Bible when it talks about Jesus going in the wilderness. It is wilderness. It's not like anything you see here. And they homesteaded in an area 
that nobody wanted, but these young people said, we want to set up a community out here. And the Jews said, why? And they said, well, we're really not sure, but God has laid it on our hearts to come out here and build a community. They said, well, what are you going to do out here? You don't have any water, and it doesn't rain, and there's no way we can, you can irrigate crops. And they said, I don't know, but God told us to come out here. Now, we're driving by you know, this area, and the guy's talking to us about it. And yet we're looking out, and on one side, the right side of the, of the bus, the west side, is just barren. There's nothing there at all. But on the left side of us, on the bus, there's crops everywhere. And he's telling us that, you see the right side of this bus? That's what it should look like on the left side. What had happened is these Jews set up their community there and dug a well and found natural living springs underneath the wilderness that nobody knew were there. But God had told these Jews, go out there and build yourself a community. The Jews love Israel. There's absolutely no way. Even they, they love the precious wilderness, and there's no way that they'll give it up. It's an everlasting covenant. God gave them the land forever. And when God says, the nations that bless thee, I will bless, and they who curse thee, I will curse, is a warning to the United States. It's a warning. And that's why I praise the Lord for a president who supports Israel. Because I believe the reason we're being blessed, at least partially, is because of the stance the nation has taken towards the nation Israel. God said to Abram, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout the generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. This is, in other words, the outer demonstration of the covenant. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house or bought with money from any strangers who is not your descendant, he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from the people. He has broken my covenant. Circumcision was an outer sign. It corresponds in a similar sense to baptism today. It's an outer sign demonstrating a covenant relationship with God. True circumcision is not the cutting away of the foreskin. True circumcision is the cutting away of the foreskin of the heart. It's the circumcision of the heart. As a matter of fact, God tells that in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verse 6, that true circumcision is of the heart. And faith is that reality of the circumcision or the act of circumcision. But God was given them a covenant that was very outward in its demonstration. Now, it's not as if other, other uh, tribes didn't practice circumcision because they did. But this was a specific ordinance God established with them on the eighth day that would symbolize to them that they were a covenant people. Many tribes, even to this day, if you, if you do any in looking into some of the uh, rites of passage in some of these uh, different tribes throughout the world, will have circumcision rites. But many of those, uh, the circumcision rites, will relate to a young male when he enters into puberty. And so he may be 12 or 13 or 14 years old when he's circumcised. In this, God has given an outward demonstration at the age of eight days, recognizing that this is but a symbol of an agreement that he will participate in the covenant that God established. And it's an outward demonstration. It doesn't save them, but it demonstrates that they're a covenant people of God. Now, if they refuse to be circumcised, they were saying, I am unwilling to follow God. And because you were unwilling to follow God, if you refuse circumcision, then you were cut off from the people. You were exiled from the nation Israel and you had nothing to do with them anymore. Then God said to Abram, Abraham, as for Sarai, which her name was contentious, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. So God took a woman who was contentious, and he gave her a new name, which means princess. And that's what Sarah means. And it's a funny thing how God sees something in Sarah that you haven't seen and I haven't seen up to this point. God saw a contentious, nagging wife and said, she shall be a princess. Give her the name. 
And I've discovered that if you label somebody something long enough, they become that which you've labeled them. You label your child stupid or ugly or dumb or klutzy, and they, they do. They'll fulfill that prophecy. And they'll be the ones who say that I can't do anything right, and I never was good at math, and I hate to study. Well, how come you hate to study? Because I, I, I just do, but they never realize it's part of it has been the labeling that takes place. And I like the labels God gives to us. God takes contentious and turns it into princess. God takes high father and takes it into father of many nations. So the labels God gives to you are, are positive labels because God sees what he wants to make in you. That's why he could get Simon and call him Cephas. That's why he could get a quivering man with no spine and make him into a rock. It's because God knows what he's going to fulfill in your life when he calls you. So he gave Sarai a name, Sarah. He said, Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her. And she shall be a mother of nations. Kings and peoples shall be from her. Now, she's probably around 89 years old at this time. And God's saying that he's going to let her have a baby. Well, Abram fell on his face and laughed, and so would I. 89-year-old, <laughs> and I'm 99? Yeah, right. Sure, Lord. And so he says within his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who's one? hundred years old, because it would take a full year for her to have a baby or close to it. He'd be a hundred by that time. Shall Sarah, who's 90 years old, bear a child? And he's laughing. <coughs> Abraham, Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. So he thinks within himself, well, it must be my son Ishmael he's talking about. And I do believe that Abraham, Abraham loved Ishmael. And he said, well, well, praise the Lord. God bless Ishmael. That's neat. Praise the Lord. What does God say? No. Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, which means laughter. <laughs> I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation." But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Then he finished talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. So Abraham took Ishmael his son, all who were born in his house, and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's, Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very same day as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very same day Abraham was circumcised and his son Ishmael. And all the men of his house, born in the house or bought with money from a stranger, were circumcised with him. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees in Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought, wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. And they said, do as you have said. So Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal. That's a little over six bushels. Now, he had said he was going to make him a morsel, but he made him a feast. And he knows he's talking to God. And so he's given to God a feast. And these two other people there that are with God are angels. So he says to his wife, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, you know, not one of these little calves that were blind and crippled, you know, like maybe we would do. Well, do you see any, you know, of the flock here that we can afford to kill right now? You know, and we'll kill that one and give it to him, you know. And that's the way we are sometimes. When I was in Greece, we, were, we stayed at some, uh, some relatives of a friend of mine's house. And uh, they had chickens. And they lived out in the country in Patras. And, you know, it was an incredible experience. I don't want to go into too much detail other than the fact that they had a lot of chickens there. 
Now, I was never around chickens in my life, but I discovered some things about them. I discovered that they like to pick on the smaller ones. And there were these two chickens we used to call the twins. The twins were the, the runts of the, of the, of the uh, whatever you call it. What do you call them when there are a lot of chickens? Is it a flock? I don't know. They were the runts of the pack. <laughs> And all the other chickens would peck on him and had taken most of their feathers off. Poor little things. Oh, we felt so sorry for those little chickens. Because they, you know, they'd come walking. You'd see all these healthy looking birds walk in strutting and here come the twins, you know. And, and Nikki would say, there's the twins. And we'd see these little beat up chickens walk in, you know, with no feathers. One night, our hostess made us a chicken dinner. And we sat there looking at these birds, you know. And I turned to Nick and I said, have you seen the twins? <laughs> and he goes, I haven't seen them yet. Uh, we wouldn't eat until we saw the twins. And when we saw the twins, we ate. Because I thought for sure they'd give us the beat up ones, you know? <laughs> you see, that's what I do. Let's get rid of puny and tiny. So he didn't do that. He went out and got a good cow. And he gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. He gave God the best, in other words. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. He did that in deference or in respect to his guests. And do you know, there are still cultures that do that. I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, a year and a half or so ago. And in the Italian home, uh, the old country Italian home, the men will sit and eat, and the women will stand while they're eating. And it was kind of an interesting thing for all the, for, for me, you know, to sit there and to see the ladies eating in the kitchen or just standing around. And it wasn't because the women considered themselves to be less than the male. It's because they respected the men. And I'll tell you something, as a man, I appreciated that. I did appreciate that very much. Not because of me being Superman or Chauvinist Joe, you know, which I am, and I admit to that. <laughs> but the fact that I considered that respectful, and the Greeks are very much that way also. Very, very respectful. When we were in Greece, we'd try to pick our own plates up, and the ladies would actually come and hit our hands and say, that is for us to do. You just sit and enjoy your meal. And we did. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to bring a couple home, but they wouldn't come. Marie wouldn't let me have one. <laughs> so then they said to him, where's Sarah, your wife? And he said, here in the tent. Now, this is a crack up. This is, this is funny. I love it. I love this. Well, you know, <laughs> Sarah's in the tent. And God's talking outside to Abraham and with these angels. So God says, I will certainly return to you, to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. So you got to picture the conversation. God's talking to Abraham, and here's Sarah, and I picture her just creeping up to the tent door with her little ear against it, and she's listening to the conversation. None of you would ever do that, but Sarah did. <laughs> Never. Oh, <laughs> I can picture that. So Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? So, you know, she thinks nobody can see her, nobody can hear her. She's behind the tent door. She's crept up there. She's listening. She's thinking within herself. God says, I'm going to bless her woman. She's busting up behind this door. Right. <laughs> you know, am I going to have the pleasure of having a baby when I'm an old lady? Sure, right. And, and Abraham, you know, he's 100 years old. No way. So what happens? The Lord says to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? <laughs> Saying, shall I surely bear a child since I am old? You can't hide from God. God heard her laughing, and he asked the husband, why is your wife laughing? <laughs> I don't know, God, you know. <laughs> is anything too hard for the Lord? Underline that for yourself sometime. At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Now notice this. God has been speaking to Abraham. God asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Sarah thinks that nobody knows she's there behind the door, and, she, and all of a sudden she yells out, 
I didn't laugh. You know, that cracks me up. I mean, I picture, you know, she thinks she's quiet and nobody knows she's there. And God's talking to Abraham, has, has, hasn't even talked to her yet. And she's answering through the door like, you know, it busts me up. That's the way we are, you know. She's, I, I've seen my children do that so many times. You know, they're hiding someplace. My children hide in the most conspicuous places when we play hide and seek. It's a crack up. My little Joseph especially, I'll say, okay, we're going to play hide and go seek, you know, and it'll be night. I'll turn all the lights off in the house. And I'll start creeping around the house looking for my children, you know. And all I need to do is stomp my feet, and I know where they're at. They all start laughing. <laughs> and I catch them, and they'll be standing in the corner with their hands over their eyes. <laughs> And I'll walk past them, and I'll say, they, I know they're here somewhere. And walk by, and they, ah! and they're laughing. <laughs> and I just picture this, like, that was Sarah. She's in the back, and she got caught up in the conversation, and she's busted, you know? I didn't laugh, you know? Yes, you did. She was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. <laughs> I heard you. Okay, then the men rose from there and looked toward Sodom, and Abram, Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. We fathers need to underline that. Look at what God requires for a father here. That he may command his children and his household after him. That they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. That the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And I believe God requires that of us. As a matter of fact, if you take time, look in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and see what God requires for a bishop. It's no different than this that you command your home and that you raise your children in a godly manner. That's what God requires. Abraham was the priest of the home. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. In other words, God already knew that Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities were perverted. He knew that. But by going there, he was demonstrating visibly to the world his mercy because he was going to bring judgment on him anyway, but people would say, well, God didn't give him a chance. God gave him a chance. God went down, sent two angels. You'll see this in a minute, to deal with him. It's not as if God, in other words, didn't know it was taking place. He knew, but this is a visible demonstration of the mercy of God. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Abraham came near and said, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And that will never take place. This is why I believe... One of the reasons I know the rapture in my heart has got to take place prior to the tribulation. God would not destroy the righteous with the wicked. Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. All right. Abraham answered and said, Indeed now, I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. You are going to now see a man who knows how to intercede in prayer. He recognizes his frailty immediately. I'm just dust and ashes. I don't have the right to intercede. But I'm going to, I'm going to continue here, Lord. I'm just dust and ashes. I've taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than 50 righteous. Would you destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, if I find there 45, I will not destroy it. Then he spoke to him yet again and said, suppose there should be 40 found there. And he said, I will not do it for the sake of 40. Now you see the persistence of intercession. He said, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 should be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Then he said, indeed, now I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy for the sake of 20. And he said, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. 
So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. I believe that what prompted Abraham to return to his place was he was satisfied at the goodness of God. He had learned something about his God, that his God is rich in mercy. And I believe this, is, this, this verse actually God gave to me about four years ago when God was teaching me something about his character. Abraham, I believe, needed to learn what his God is like. Abraham needed to know whether the judge of the whole earth would do that which was right. Abraham knew that God would not destroy the wicked and the righteous, but he needed to hear God say it himself to him, and that's what God was doing here. Notice he stopped at 10 and walked away satisfied. Do you know that Lot and his family represented 10 people? Certainly Lot, a righteous man, has led his family to the Lord. But do you remember what had happened to Lot? He had compromised. He had set his tent up just outside of Sodom. The next time we saw him, he was living in, in Sodom. Now Sodom is pretty close to living in him. And that's what we're going to see here in chapter 19. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom as a judge. He was a government official now. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go your way. And they said, No, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly. So they turned in to him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread. Now I wonder why Mrs. Lot didn't bake. Notice Sarah did. That's kind of interesting if you look at it. You know, where was his wife? Where was his wife? In the custom at that time, she should have been the one baking the bread. This tells you something about his home life. He baked the unleavened bread and they ate. Now, before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, in other words, it didn't matter from what social status or what financial status of, of any sort that they had, all these people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them in a carnal manner. In other words, they wanted to have, um, they wanted to have intercourse with the men. They wanted to commit homosexual acts on them. Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him, and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now... I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. Lot is paying the price of compromise to the point where he was willing to take his own little girls out there and give them to this group of men. That's the price of compromise but they didn't want him. They didn't want his girls. They said, stand back. And then they said, hey, this one came into sojourn, and now he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. And he said, you know, hey, these people were living terrible lives. God has already said their wickedness has reached up to heaven. He's heard the cries of it. And when somebody stood up and said, it's wrong what you're doing, they said, who are you, in other words, to judge us? What gives you the right to tell me my lifestyle is wrong and is not acceptable to God? And that's what the world will say to the Christian when the Christian says that sin is sin. They always will say that. What gives you the right to judge me? Who told you that you can tell me what I'm doing is wrong? Live and let live. So they said, we're going to take care of you now. You came in to sojourn amongst us, now you want to be our judge. We'll take care of you. But the men reached out their hands... These are the angels, reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. 
Now, you and I would, by that time, just run around the house, not grab anything, just grab our wives, grab our kids, drag them outside while these people are groping around out there and get out of town fast. Now, I think I would do that. I would hope that I would do that. Let's see what compromise will do to you, though. So, Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. In other words, Lot had no influence in their life at all. And this is the result of compromise. If you're trying to win someone to the Lord and you blow it in front of them habitually, whether it, whether it be that you just accept their lifestyle, never make a comment, never say anything to them, just allow them to be what they are, when you finally get to the point where you need to warn them, they're not going to listen because they've gotten used to being accepted by the way you have accepted them. They will. This is why it's very important for you when you develop relationships to be very upfront about your relationship with Jesus so people know where you're at. Because that lays the foundation. They may not accept you for it. They may not like what you are, but they know where you're coming from. Because I have discovered this in the hard ways by thinking I can be a silent witness and never saying anything until I needed to say something. By then I'd lost the ability to have any impact in these people's lives. They need to know where you're coming from immediately. You know what's sad is the sons-in-laws had absolutely no respect for Lot at all. Result of compromise. He's, they said, sure. And they thought he was joking. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered... He was delaying. That's what that word means. He was just kind of kicking around the house. He didn't want to leave. He was lingering. This shows the mercy of God because the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. You know, praise God for his mercy because he could have left him there. It was the intercession of Abraham that drew Lot out. God honored the intercession. You'll see this in a minute. And he took him by the hand and he pulled him out. <laughs> so it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Lot said, Please, no, my lords. Indeed, now your servant has found, if your servant has found, uh, favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. Now that's incredible to me. He has already seen this, th that the angels blinded these men. He already knows that, that God is doing a work. He's going to destroy it. God has already promised to save him. And yet what is he doing? No, I'll die. This is where he had gotten in his walk with God. See now, this city is near enough to flee, and it's a little one. Please, let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said to him, See, I have favored you concerning this thing also, in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. Zoar is one of the five cities uh, that was mentioned earlier in chapter 14 in verse 2 that had... Um, battled with the Babylonian kings. It originally was called Bela, but it was a small city outside of Sodom and Gomorrah's, and uh, so God is going to overthrow not only Sodom and Gomorrah, but the surrounding two other cities, but he saved Zoar because uh, Lot ran in there to be saved there. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. It was totally devastated. But his wife looked behind, looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Now that word in the Hebrew, when it says his wife looked back, it means that she looked back in a longing fashion. Her body left Sodom, but her heart remained behind. And she was commanded, don't even look back, just flee, get out of it. And it's kind of like some people who get up in the morning to go to church, but their hearts are still in bed. It's like, I think there are many people who, who do religious things with their bodies, but their spirits are far from God. As a matter of fact, Jesus said that. So you worship me with your, with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. And that's what happened here. Oh, yeah, she was taken out. She was taken out to be saved, but her heart remained back there. 
She turned around with a longing gaze and desired to stay there, and she got caught up in the destruction. It was an incredible destruction. If you ever get a chance to see the Dead Sea area where this place belongs, there's nothing alive there. That's why they call it the Dead Sea. There's nothing living in that surrounding area, nothing at all. It used to be a fertile plain, watered and beautiful, like the Garden of Eden, it was said earlier. Beautiful. They had running water, you know, this river coming through, and the people were able to build their encampments around there. They had beautiful agriculture. It was a beautiful place. But when God destroyed it, you go there now and look at it. It's incredible. Nothing's alive in that surrounding area. Nothing can live there in the water. It, it's too salty. It's too mineral. Filled with it. And she looked back and got caught in the judgment of God. Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land, which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities on the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. Keep praying for your families. God listens. Then Lot went up out of Zor and dwelt in the mountains. And his two daughters were with him, for he was afraid to dwell in Zoar. It may have been that these people resented Abraham, Abraham, who used to be an inhabitant of Sodom, a, a judge of Sodom, and now he escaped, and he's the only one who lived. So he was afraid to remain in Zor. And he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. Now the firstborn said to the younger, Our father's old, and there's no man on the earth to come into us, as is the custom of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine. Now it's interesting. They didn't have anything when they left, but they acquired some booze. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that he may preserve the seed of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he didn't know when she lay down or when she arose. It happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Indeed, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also, and you go in and lie with him that we may preserve the lineage or the seed of our father. Then they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. And this, of anything, is a terrible demonstration of, of the ultimate compromise. I don't know that Lot knew what was going on, but he did later on when he saw his virgin daughters pregnant. And it must have been a horrible realization for him to realize that those children that his daughters were carrying were his. And I don't know, talk about a horrible realization. It must have been a horrible realization for him to have seen that. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab, which means the father. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami, which means son of my people. He is the father of the people of Ammon to this day. The Ammonites made perpetual war with Israel. Both of these, the Moabites and the Ammonites. And that's the fruit, I think, the final fruit of compromise. 